Camp 828, Marine Corps vet. Uh, how many vets do we have in the audience today? Right on. Thank you for coming. If you don't mind right now, I'd like uh, Reverend Tom Fowler to say a prayer for us before we start this event. So men, if you'll remove your hats. It's Southern that's uncovered. Shall we bow together? Dear Heavenly Father, we have so much to be grateful for. We're grateful for our country, we're grateful for our people. We are so grateful for our heritage, for those that stood up and bled and died for us, handing us a good America. We are grateful, Father, for Virginia. We thank you for Major Sutherland and Colonel Withers. We thank you for the ones who stood for us long ago, for those today that wave their heritage, their flag proudly. We ask your protection. We ask your strength. We ask your forgiveness. Watch over us, all of us, in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, does everybody know the definition of a veteran? A veteran, whether, act, whether active duty, retired, National Guard, or Reserve, is someone at one point in their life wrote a check made payable to the United States of America for the amount of up to and including their life. That's honor, and that's a way that many people in this country who no longer understand that. There's a lot of people who don't understand what it is to be a veteran. I have a couple quotes I'd like to do if I can get my glasses out. This is from uh, President George Bush on October 30th, 2001. We must remember that many who served in our military never lived to be called veterans. We must remember many had their lives changed forever by experiences or injuries of combat. All veterans are example of service and citizenship for every American to remember and follow. And then on, on the same day, he says, we're a nation of patriots. The attacks of September 11th, the attacks that have followed, were designed to break our spirit, but instead they've created a new spirit in America. We have a renewed spirit of patriotism. We see it in the countless flags that are flying everywhere in America. We hear it in familiar phrases that moves us more deeply than ever before. I'll give you a couple of facts about veterans. There are currently 25 million living veterans. Over 48 million Americans have served in the military during war and peace since 1776. Every year, about 80,000 veterans are buried in one of the cemeteries of our national cemetery system. The hard part for me is this one. U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs estimated that there are 131,000 veterans who are homeless on any given night and approximately, approximately twice as many experience homelessness over the course of a year. That's unacceptable. 131,000 vets homeless every year. We need to do something about that. National Coalition of Homeless Veterans estimates that the VA serves about 25% of veterans in need, a figure that would leave approximately 300,000 veterans each year to seek assistance from local government agencies and volunteer organizations. In general, the needs of homeless veterans do not differ from those of other homeless people. The National Coalition for Homeless Veterans suggested more effective programs are community-based, Nonprofit veteran helping veterans. However, there is some, some evidence that programs which recognize and acknowledge veterans' experience may be more successful in helping homeless veterans transition into stable housing. Until serious efforts are made to address the underlying causes of homelessness, including inadequate wages, lack of affordable housing, and lack of accessibility, affordable health care, and the tragedy of homeless among both veterans and non-veterans will continue to plague American communities. U.S. Senator John Kyle from Arizona once said, one thing that makes our military the best in the world is a certain knowledge to each soldier, sailor, airman, and marine 
know that they can always count on their comrades should they need help. And they will never be abandoned. As long as we continue to hold gatherings in America like the one today, I think we can be confident our nation will survive and prosper for many generations to come. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to introduce a uh, retired colonel from the Air Force, Greg Eanes. Greg is also an author and historian. Uh, he has two bronze stars. Uh, so. You know, he, he has a lot of credibility, and he has a good message to, to give each and every one of us. Before, before I do that, there was one other organization I'd like to, to say something about, and that's Virginia Wounded Warriors. They were the recipient of the proceeds from the Confederate ball that we held back in April. Uh, all, of, all the money that's donated to the Virginia Wounded Warriors stays in Virginia. So if you're looking for worthy causes, donate to the homeless veterans in, in, in Virginia and to the Virginia Wounded Warriors. Thanks. Here's Greg. Thank you. There you go. He's taller than I am. Thank you all for coming out. Um, I see a lot of my comrades from the American Legion, the Veterans of Foreign Wars, and other organizations present, and I want to thank you for being here. And I also want to bring uh, special recognition to some of the strongest supporters of Confederate heritage. That is the sons of Union veterans of the Civil War, and they have a table right over here on the other side of the Pennsylvania Vindicators Camp. And if you haven't been by to visit them, go by and tell them thank you for coming by. History is not a weapon to be wielded in the pursuit of vengeance. It is a tool that is used to build a better future. Our American military history and monuments to our dead are often placed at risk of destruction and misinterpretation. The Sutherland Mansion Confederate War Memorial is just one of the latest. The Confederate soldier is an American soldier, so recognized by multiple Congresses, multiple presidents, and more importantly by Union Army veterans. A Union soldier at Appomattox, speaking to one of Robert E. Lee's soldiers, said, and I quote, if I were you, I would be the proudest man in the world. Such was the esteem held for the Confederate soldier by his Union counterpart. Most American veterans feel that the disturbance of any war memorial is disrespectful and harmful to the memory of those patriots who served their states and nation in times of war and peace. Fortunately, Virginia has protections in state law. That law serves a purpose to ensure the preservation of all Virginia's war memorials from the ever-changing winds of political correctness and the fickle emotions of the body politic. It is designed to place a check on the irrational, emotion-driven decision-making. As recent events have illustrated, the law works as it was intended. Virginia's law is a role model for the nation. It is so well-crafted that in 2012, the American Veterans, or AMVETS, which is one of the big four veterans groups, asked Congress to pass federal legislation modeled on Virginia's state code. The same year, the Sons of Spanish-American War Veterans also asked Congress to codify the same protections. VFW and American Legion Post in Virginia have passed similar resolutions, and all Virginia's veterans groups support Virginia's law. Threats to Confederate memorials cannot be viewed in isolation. What happens to Confederate monuments has implications for all other American memorials and the veterans they honor. Let me be clear. This is not just a Confederate heritage issue. This is a veterans issue. One that concerns nearly one million Virginia veterans, and as you just heard, 25 million American veterans. Many political activists, some of whom came of age and protested American soldiers during the Vietnam era, do with disdain anything military, including memorials they mistakenly see as a glorification of war. What our critics fail to understand is that we veterans do not glorify war. We do, however, celebrate the lives of American men and women who are willing to give up to their last full measure of devotion 
to defend their homes and the concepts of American liberty as I understood it to be. And this most certainly includes the Confederate soldier. Allow me to cite a few of these recent threats to uh, non-Civil War memorials and truthful interpretations of our history. The most egregious, in my opinion, happened in 1994 with the Smithsonian Institute. They were able to obtain the Enola Gay, the aircraft that dropped the first atomic bomb in World War II. The original left-wing educational interpretation portrayed the Japanese as the victims and the Americans as the aggressors. Seems to me they forgot Pearl Harbor. That's right. They also called it a race war. It highlighted the loss of Japanese lives lost and minimized the potential loss of American lives had the United States been forced to invade Japan in 1945. Fortunately for us, many World War II veterans were still alive and after a long fight got the museum director fired and ensured a balanced interpretation of events was presented to the American public. Imagine if this had happened 50 years later when the participants of World War II were dead. Who would have defended their honor and their good name? I would like to think that we non-World War II veterans would have leapt to meet the challenge. In 2014, the city of King, North Carolina was sued because of a donated war memorial. The memorial was a remembrance of soldiers from all wars, and the memorial looked like a typical GI in Vietnam. It contained a soldier kneeling at a grave, and at that grave was a cross like you would find in any American military cemetery. The city did not want to face the expenses of a long court battle because of the cross and chose to surrender. They dismantled the monument. Currently, the secular humanists want to tear down the Bladensburg, Maryland World War I Veterans Memorial. It was erected in, eight, in 1925. It is also known as the War Mothers Memorial. It contains the names of men who lost their lives in the Great War for Democracy. It too is in the shape of a cross, and it too sits on a small strip of public land. The people filing suit want to either demolish the memorial or deface it by cutting off the arms of the cross to make it a slab. The American Legion is fighting this effort and is being defended by the Liberty Institute, whose spokesman recently said, will continue to defend this veteran's memorial to see that it stands for another hundred years. The men in honors, others who have served, and those in uniform today deserve no less. In Hawaii, the Waikiki Natatorium War Memorial to World War I veterans is also under threat. Built in 1927, it has been designated by the National Trust for Historic Preservation as one of the 11 most endangered sites in the United States. And in 2014, it was cited as a national treasure, meaning it is irreplaceable. Yet the last two mayors have vowed to tear it down for economic development purposes. Two recent cases have been precedent setting. Both have established a pattern for transferring public lands where these memorials sit to suitable private nonprofits so these memorials can be retained in place and cared for at private expense rather than taxpayer expense. <clears throat> The Mount Soledad Veterans Memorial Cross in San Diego was dedicated to Korean War veterans in 1954. In 1989, a group sued for the memorial's removal because it displayed a Christian cross. After 25 years of state and federal litigation, a tremendous cost to their taxpayers, it took congressional action to authorize the eventual transfer of the war memorial and the land to a private nonprofit known as the Mount Soledad Memorial Association. The other case is the Mojave War Memorial in Sema, California. Dedicated to World War I veterans, it too contained a cross. It too was the subject to repeated vandalism and destruction. Again, it took congressional action to enable the government to transfer the land in April of 2012 to a local VFW post. This was after a legal challenge that went all the way to the United States Supreme Court. Individuals that object to war memorials on public property often cite their taxes are helping to maintain the monument. And that's a fair observation. And it is an argument we've heard about Confederate mon uh, monuments throughout the South. But another fair observation is that many people who want to see these Confederate monuments preserved and protected on public property are also taxpayers. They too are stakeholders with valid opinions and the tax dollars that support them. They too 
reflect the sentiment of President Theodore Roosevelt, who said, and I quote, as a reunited people, we have the right, we have the right to feel the same pride in the valor of the man who conscientiously risked his life in the Confederate uniform that we have in the man who fought in the blue. Amen. With that in mind, the transfer of war memorials and the land they sit on to private nonprofits appears to be a reasonable compromise in certain cases. The small monument that sits on these grounds proudly under the third national flag of the Confederacy is a war memorial, as is the entire Sutherland Memorial Mansion. The public record is clear in this regard. Those who want to deface the smaller monument by pulling down the third national Confederate flag are asking city council to break established law. They are asking city council to violate a lawful contract with the Heritage Preservation Association, which specifically spelled out this monument would include the third national Confederate flag. And they are asking city council to become the first town in America to engage in ethnocide, the deliberate destruction of the culture of an ethnic group. The descendants of Confederate veterans share a common cultural background, technically, that makes them an ethnic group. Any attempt to deface the monument will result in a court battle which will be long drawn out and needlessly waste the taxpayer dollars of damnable citizens, dollars that can be spent on more pressing issues. The Mount Soledad and Mojave War Memorial cases illustrate the long-term cost and the resolve of veterans to protect memorials to our dead. Danville City Council can learn from others' experience. They can transfer the property to a private nonprofit that will honor the mission of the original donors. Besides being good political sense, it makes solid business sense. Yeah. The Danville Museum of Fine Arts had a revenue shortfall of $612,000 between 2008 and 2013. And this comes from their IRS Form 990, which they're all required to file. That's an average loss of $100,000 a year. A recent architectural and engineering inspection revealed there are several thousand dollars in maintenance and upgrades needed. The building and grounds could cost taxpayers over a million or more dollars in the next 10 years. Danville City Council has been offered up to one half million dollars for the Sutherland Mansion and the grounds. By taking the money and transferring the property, the city would save themselves one million dollars over ten years and come out a half a million dollars ahead in cash, a positive budget impact of 1.5 million dollars or more. That's money that can be allocated to higher city priorities. Transferring the property is a viable remedy for Danville and it's good business sense. And this brings me to some final educational points regarding Danville's dilemma. And these are things that must be pointed out. They need to be said. First, we must understand that there are people of goodwill on both sides of the discussion with a firm commitment to traditional Judeo-Christian beliefs. Our spiritual teachings allow us to treat each other with decency and mutual respect even when we disagree. We in the Confederate heritage and veteran community do what we do out of love the love that God gave us. We do it for love of God, love of country, love of our Constitution, and love of family. We are motivated by that love. Our responses to city affronts will always be lawful and nonviolent. Second, the Confederate heritage community has uniformly and routinely condemned hate groups who have abused the Confederate flag. This is a matter of public record. Unfortunately, the heritage groups could not trademark the Confederate battle flag any more than they could trademark the United States flag to prevent its use by hate groups. For the Confederate heritage community to abandon the Confederate flag means surrender. Surrender to either the Klan or surrender to a hateful liberal agenda of cultural cleansing. And let me make this clear. The Confederate heritage community will never surrender its flags to hate groups. Yeah. 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 Eric, it's not hate.
Third, hate groups are vermin. Hateful people victimized people of color during the civil rights era. Some of those victims are still angry and bitter, and they have a right to their anger. They do have a right to that anger. But that anger is misdirected when it is aimed at monuments to our Confederate dead. The victims of 1960s hate are somehow under the mistaken impression that by tearing down our war memorials, they are wreaking vengeance for wrongs committed in the civil rights era. We are sensitive to their pain, but two wrongs do not make a right. We also caution that their anger and desire for vengeance makes them imitators of those who originally caused their pain. I urge all citizens to remember the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, and I quote, like an unchecked cancer, hate corrodes the personality and eats away its vital unity. Hate destroys a man's sense of values and his objectivity. And I say to them, do not become what you claim to despise. Fourth, there's, a much, there's much in our free society that is offensive. The most offensive thing I can recall is a work of, so -called, of a so-called artist entitled Emerge, Kiss the Christ. A photograph of a Christian crucifix in a jar of urine. The artist received 20,000 federal tax dollars to create it. It was displayed in a federally taxpayer-funded museum. Not only was it offensive and paid for with our tax dollars, it was hurtful to those of us of the Christian faith. My point is this. In a free society, hurtful is not justification to remove from public view the things one may deem offensive. As honest Americans, in our free and open society, we have to exercise tolerance. And tolerance, like prejudice, is a two-way street. And finally, Dr. King dreamed of a table of brotherhood that is open to all persons, specifically citing the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners. Dr. King died working for that dream. We in the Confederate heritage community share Dr. King's dream that we all be treated equal. We are very much a part of that table of brotherhood. To those who oppose this war memorial to our dead, I say this, break bread with us, pray with us, spend time with us, judge us by the content of our character. Understand that the positive aspects of our Confederate military heritage are very much a part of us. It is in our blood. Indeed, it is our family. We would not reject it any more than honest Christians would reject our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we will exercise all lawful and peaceful options to protect the rights and privileges of citizenship that we too are entitled to enjoy as American citizens. We are very much a part of our country's multicultural fabric and we're not going away. Understand it and accept it. You'll find that if we are treated with tolerance and mutual respect, you'll have natural allies on issues of joint concern such as education and jobs. In summary, all of our war memorials are sacred to the memories of the American men and women who served, who fought, and who died. If public entities no longer wish to care for them, then we in the veteran and military heritage communities are prepared to step up to fill that void. But it is a sad day in the history of our country when the public at large refuses to honor those citizens who have risen to defend it. What message does disrespect of our war dead and their memorials send to our youth who will be entrusted with protecting our freedoms and future conflicts? Is this how we wish to be remembered? That is not a course for honorable people. Let's honor our military heritage proudly and teach our children to honor our heroes and emulate their example. And I leave you with these words by President Teddy Roosevelt, who in 1905 said of the nation's Confederate veterans, and I quote, they by their deeds reflect credit upon their descendants and upon all Americans, both because they did their duty in war and because they did their duty in peace. Thank you.